question. Good evening, everyone. We'll start shortly. We have a few more people that are still joining the presentation. So hopefully within the next few minutes. I think we're good, Dr. Muhammad, if you'd like to get started. Absolutely, thank you. Good evening, parents, teachers, staff, and administrators. My name is Dr. Ajuna Muhammad, and I have the honor of serving as the president of the Home with Lossmore Parent Association, along with fellow parents, Natalie McCoy, Karen Barber Walker, and Jennifer Gordon. The Home with Lossmore Parent Association, also known as the HFPA, is dedicated to assisting and enriching communications with HF families, staff, administration, and the community for the overall success of the Homewood Lossmore student body. We would like to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us this evening for a very important discussion about the upcoming academic year with our superintendent, Dr. Von Mansfield, and superintendent-elect Dr. Scott Wakely. As a point of reference, I'd also like to share with you all that we do plan to hold meetings at the beginning of the academic year sometime in early September. So be sure to look out for those announcements that come through, um, through the weekly announcements through your email. I would now like to turn it over to our superintendent, Dr. Von Mansfield. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed, and certainly appreciate all the help from HFPA, and we'll look forward to getting to the first meeting at some point in September. So thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, we thought it would very, be very important to at least give our parents an opportunity to hear a little bit more about uh, what we can expect for the start of the school year. So we did convene the administrators, and hopefully we can process through all of what's out there, which is quite a bit relative to um, information from the Illinois Department of Public Health, um, the Illinois State Board of Education, and also the uh, Center for Disease Control in, out of Atlanta, mm -hmm. and just pulling all those things together so that we can give everyone a sense of um, how we're gonna open up for the school year and the kinds of things that you can expect, and also to give you a chance to hopefully ask some questions. We did send out a survey earlier last week, and we got a pretty good response uh, from that survey, over a thousand, uh, are close to a thousand responses. So with that, I think you'll have a pretty robust um, presentation this evening in terms of information. And I would like to introduce who's going to be on the call. And uh, administrators, when it's your time to present for a particular slide, if you would reintroduce yourself and your position, I think that would be important. Um, as I go through this list, I'm confident people aren't gonna put a name with a face right away, aside from your little tag underneath your name. Um, but we do have with us this evening, uh, Ms. Jody Bryant, who's our Director of Human Resources and PR, along with Dr. Uh, Jennifer Hester, who's our Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development Coordinator. We also have Mr. Craig Fanton, our Associate Principal, as well as Mr. Matt Like, who's our Athletic Director, and Ms. Gail Smith, our Director of Activities. And you'll also be hearing from Mr. Jim Schmidt, 
who is our department chair for pupil personnel services and also on the call to answer some questions if they do arise from the finance department, um, our chief business officer, Dr. Lawrence Cook. And with that, I'd like to begin tonight's program with our superintendent elect. As you know, I'm finishing up the school year. So the board um, had the foresight to hire my replacement who turns out to be Dr. Scott Wakely, um, who is now a Homewood Flossmoor Viking. So Dr. Wakely, maybe we'll let you kick this off and uh, get us started, sir. Sure. Uh, first, I, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Muhammad and the HFPA um, for the opportunity. It's so important for us to have a, a direct line of communication uh, with our parents and stakeholders. So uh, first, I'd like to also say that uh, I'm very appreciative of, of the opportunity um, to work with uh, Dr. Mansfield and this tremendous team and, and the HF staff and community. So with that, uh, we want to get right into our information. Uh, so we'll go to the first slide uh, that I'd like to talk a little bit about. Um, Dr. Mansfield uh, mentioned uh, the IDPH, um, Department of Public Health, the Illinois State Board of Education, and of course the, the CDC, which is the national organization as, as all of you know. So there are some things that are, are very much different this year um, since we're somewhat outside of the uh, emergency declaration that the governor made uh, for last year. Uh, the most important difference this year that was made by the State Board of Education is uh, pursuant to uh, the school code that all schools must resume fully in-person learning uh, for the 21-22 school year. So that is a, obviously a, uh, a large departure than the expectations that were um, given to schools last year. So schools are really given the guidance to do whatever you must do in order for all students to be fully in person uh, for school attendance. Now, while there is some accommodation uh, that is made, the accommodations really are made uh, for those who are not vaccinated and fall under a quarantine uh, that is, is still being worked on by the IDPH in terms of, of those guidelines. So really there isn't um, the, the plethora of options that are given to, to students um, just by choice as there has been in the past. Um, so this is something that has been given um, to all schools in the state of Illinois from the State Board of Education. So next slide, please. So one of the things that we're gonna talk about uh, the minimum expectations that the Illinois Department of Public Health has put forward. So uh, the IDPH has fully adopted the CDC as many of you, if not all of you have seen on the news uh, and, the, and, and talked about in the papers, masks should be worn. Um, by all individuals who are not vaccinated. And, and so we do know that there is a large portion of our community, not necessarily um, Homewood Flossmoor High School students because most of them are, all of them are over the age of 12. Uh, but we also know that there's a large portion of our community and siblings that, that are not able to be vaccinated at this point. Uh, so the, the guidance that uh, we have from the health departments, the public health department, CDC, is we're going to maintain that three foot physical distance uh, as best we can um, in order to maintain full attendance in school. So these are some mitigating factors and we still are going to talk about layers of protection. So, and, and by that we mean wearing masks, having three feet physical distance uh, whenever possible. Um, we, the ventilation, the hand washing, um, all of those things, making sure that we're being extra vigilant uh, with our children who may not feel well or obviously have any of the symptoms, um, whether it's the temperature or all the other things that people are, are very familiar with at this point, that we make sure that we don't send sick kids to school. Uh, and another aspect that we are currently investigating at HF is the screening testing. Um, we are looking, in fact, we will be meeting with representatives next week um, 
using the shield test, which is the test you may have heard. It's been developed by the University of Illinois and is being implemented uh, really throughout the country, but throughout Illinois as just another layer of, um, of preventative testing to make sure that uh, if we do have kids who are asymptomatic, um, but maybe carriers are positive for COVID that we can ensure that our, our environment is safe as, as humanly possible. So that is something that we will certainly give more information uh, to our families as that information becomes available. Uh, again, we will be meeting with those representatives to uh, make some decisions on, on what's the best use of preventative testing um, as another layer uh, to keep our, our students, family, and staff safe. Okay, next slide, please. And so finally, many, you know, as I've mentioned, many of our students' um, family members are, are under the age of 12 um, that are not eligible for vaccine. Um, so we recognize, again, the layer of prevention strategies that we're trying to put. Um, we should be monitoring the just as we have in the past, the level of transmission, not only uh, in our in the South Cook region, but specifically in, in our district and our feeder district. So we make sure that um, as we have in the past, if we need to pivot um, to be more restrictive in order to protect our, our students and the learning environment and our staff, we certainly will do that. Um, so those are some of the uh, prevention strategies. Uh, I think the the staff has, um, and and I will say the the cleaning staff and the maintenance staff and everyone um, has been um, extra vigilant even over the summer with summer school, making sure that uh, this is uh, these minimum expectations uh, are as safe as possible uh, for our students coming back to in person learning. So thank you. We can have the next slide. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about because we have changed directions slightly just from the last probably two weeks when we sent out our letter. And in the letter, we said that it would most likely be mask optional uh, for students coming in. Uh, but we've changed that rationale given some of the guidance. And now what we've kind of come across relative to uh, things that we can't necessarily mitigate in terms of some of our students being vaccinated, some not, as well as some of our staff being vaccinated and some not. And, and whether that's by choice or um, you know, personal decision or maybe even medical uh, situations that would prevent people from being vaccinated, it still doesn't preclude us from trying to keep them as safe as possible as well. When we were in hybrid this past spring and, and some of last year, we, um, only had approximately 600 students max in the building at any, any given time. But well, we're gonna have all nearly 3000 kids and staff back in the building, actually over 3000 students and staff, you know, back in the building all at one time. And the more that we thought about um, how we best can serve the needs of everyone, because we will also have some eighth grade students in the building who are taking some of the high school level courses to keep everyone safe and also take into account that some of our students are going home to younger siblings, uh, as well as you know, caregiving for maybe older relatives. So at this juncture, we've kind of moved from encouraging mask wearing to requiring mask wearing while we're inside. I think we still can make some accommodations. And actually our kids are fortunate to this grief for once that we have two buildings because once they pass to the other building, either north or south, while they're passing, um, obviously, if they need to get a mask break, we would encourage them to do it at that time. Uh, even for those students that happen to be in either north or south buildings <clears throat> for several class periods, um, they indeed could go outside and, and somewhat get a recharge before coming back into the building uh, while they'll have to mask up. And a lot of this is due to the prevalence of you know, the COVID-19 variants. When you take a look at some of the statistics of what the um, new people being exposed to COVID, the majority and then some are the variants at this juncture. So we really still don't know how quietly or how that's quite gonna pan out. So we figured that over the next several weeks, we could make a call on a regular basis after taking a look at 
current information and, and current statistics to continue to stay masked or to start um, <clears throat> the school year uh, in a different fashion. But at this juncture, we feel it's safe to start the school year with everyone masked from our, our students as well as our staff You know, at this juncture. It also helps out with the quarantine requirements. Um, some of the school districts, the larger school districts with larger schools such as ourselves, uh, mid-year when all the kids did come back before we completely went out, ran into some issues because there were times where a classroom quarantine and then three classrooms had to quarantine and, and students were missing out. Um, we're hoping that this will alleviate that roadblock in the sense that if there is a um, case where a student does become exposed in some form or fashion, as long as they're masked, those students, it is my understanding, and I'll have Mrs. Bryant maybe get a little bit more detail behind it, but they do not have to be excluded from school as in the earlier um, guidance. Now they can continue on if they're masked. So maybe somewhat conservative, but I think in terms of what's best for everyone, given all the different components that we have to deal with, that, that's where we've fallen. You know, the lab classes, um, students are right next to each other. Um, music classes are still um, right next to each other. And also the physical, physical education classes, we're hoping to get those students back in into the building. And during that time, we, we do believe that those kids, and Mr. Fanton will talk more about it later, will have to get you know suited up and they'll have their PE classes and, and swim classes and things of that nature. So, you know, again, we've kind of gone from encouraged to required mask wearing. And just this past summer school, most of our kids, actually all of our kids did wear a um, mask. And I think we had between four or 500 kids, if not more, uh, during the building. And they seemed to be in a mode that this wasn't an issue for them. So, you know, summer school finished fairly successfully for us uh, with these conditions in place. So it is a lot easier for us, given the routine that's already in place, to start this way and to be able to make a decision in the weeks to come to um, lighten up and maybe change that if at all, you know, the circumstances warrant it. So again, in terms of um, all this being our first time together after this year and a half, we just want to make sure that um, we keep a sense of responsibility for everyone and not call anyone out because they've not gotten a vaccination or they can't get a vaccination. And also for those students, even if they're vaccinated, um, that there would be nothing wrong with them to continue to you know, wear a mask as well. Um, so I think in terms of the survey, and I talked to uh, the administrators and we're gonna ask Mrs. Bryant to show basically how many of our students are vaccinated and maybe some of the results from the uh, survey. This is Brian. Sure. I'm Jody Bryan. I'm the director of HR and PR here at HF. And thank you all for joining us. The wanted to share with you the family survey results. We did have a thousand respondents and that is a, a quite large number for us. So thank you everyone for filling out that survey. And as you can see on the screen, 76% of respondents reported their student will be vaccinated by the start of school. 19% reported that they will not be vaccinating their child. And then the remainder are um, individual answers with individual circumstances. So once the um, additional students are vaccinated, we would hopefully be around 80 to 82 percent. Uh, several individuals indicated in the comments a desire for HF to have another vaccination event at HF. So we were also considering doing it during the school day when students were accessible and um, perhaps that would work out better for, for families. So we're trying to make that happen and we will be communicating uh, with everyone when we have more information. And lastly, I just wanted to state in regards to the survey that your comments shape this presentation and um, are very meaningful to our planning even um, in the upcoming weeks as we prepare for school. So continue to provide those comments. And just a reminder, if you do have questions to put them in the chat and we will be looking at those uh, towards the end of the survey or the end of the presentation. So on the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about mitigation and prevention measures. And they're very similar to what Dr. Wakeley talked about in terms of the recommendations from the CDC and the IDPH. So we talked about masking already. We talked about physical distancing. So we are going to do our best to maintain at least three feet of physical distance in all classrooms. Uh, when that's not possible, the, the guidance is to layer additional levels of mitigation with the most um, responsive being masking. So 
I'm not sure everyone's aware, but a lot of us um, are aware of what we did last spring. We do have air purifiers in every classroom. We encourage hand washing, respiratory etiquette, and the other things that are, are listed here. And we're also listed in the parent mailer. And we will continue with the cleaning and the disinfecting routines that we have been practicing uh, you know, for, for several months. Another important piece is we have launched that COVID-19 dashboard last year. And that is a form that you the parents have been filling out on our website. It's under the student and the parent tab. And essentially, if someone in your family or in your household has COVID or is required to quarantine because of close contact, we just ask that you fill that out and that we'll send that to one of the administrators at HF and we will be in contact with you. That information is confidential. We don't share that with anybody. So please know that once you share that with us, it will be confidential. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about that we will be continuing, oh, this is the dashboard. There's the icon for the dashboard. So when you go to the website, um, that is the COVID-19 reporting form, and you can just click on there, and that will prompt um, an administrator to reach out, and then we will proceed with quarantining and contact tracing. So I wanted to touch a little bit about, if you could go back, Pat, two slides, a little bit on the, the quarantining and the contact tracing. You know, one of the most important pieces to the masking policy is that this year, at the start of this year, which was different than the spring, if students are in close proximity to each other, less than six to three feet, if they are properly masked, they will not have to quarantine. So we will not have that seven to 14 day exclusion from school where students are losing instruction because they were in close proximity to somebody who tested positive for COVID-19, as long as they are properly masked. So that I think is one of the Oh goodness, one of the, I think the most important reasons to continue to wear masks is in terms of keeping our kids in school and keeping them in class, obviously also keeping everybody safe as well. So in terms of additional quarantine procedures, who has to quarantine how long, the IDPH has not updated that from the spring. They will be doing that shortly. And then we will be following those parameters. We will continue to contact trace with every positive COVID a uh, case that we are made aware of. So we will be going in and doing the interviews as we have, have done in the past with the students and with the staff. And the last thing I wanted to mention is the COVID dashboard that is on the website. Under district info it is our COVID dashboard. And on that dashboard, you will find the, on a weekly basis, and we update it as we get new numbers, um, but you will find the number of students and staff that were diagnosed with COVID in the last week. And you will also find the number of students and staff that are under quarantine. And then when you scroll down to that section of the website, you can also see the community metrics page. And that is a program that is developed by Northwestern University that pulls the data directly from the Illinois Department of Health. And it updates actually on a weekly basis. And we have pre-populated that with the six, six zip codes that feed into our school district. So we will be monitoring those metrics closely and if necessary, make additional um, layers to our mitigations. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm Jen Hester and I am the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development. And we're gonna move on to talk about the fun stuff, which is teaching and learning. Um, so in thinking about coming back for in-person learning, we are all incredibly excited to have all of our students with us. In the classrooms, we'll find two students and teachers fully engaged in learning with regular class sizes. Um, that will, again, I think you've heard it several times tonight, our desks will be arranged with at least uh, three feet in between them wherever possible. And moving back into um, some collabor collaborative structures for learning, in addition to learning independently, our kids will be in partners, they'll be in small groups, and again, we'll emphasize that social distancing. Our students will continue to use Google Classroom and a lot of the Google tools and applications that you saw last year. However, now we have that important opportunity to close those lids and uh, work together as, um, as partners in the classroom. So we'll also engage without the use of technology. And if we can move to the next slide. All of our staff will be focusing on building students' strengths. So you'll hear us constantly um, talking about a strengths-based mindset. 
I think we can all agree that all of our students and probably all of us gained a lot of knowledge and experience last year, uh, I should say last year and a half, that we wouldn't have gained without the pandemic. And so we are entering the school year with um, that thought and that strengths-based mindset of all kids have valuable knowledge, they have experiences and they have skills regardless of what their learning experience looked like last year. Our teachers are going to use all available data from last school year to understand their students and their learning needs. And additionally, as they begin to work with students and get to know them through instruction and inform informal assessments, our teachers will continue to learn about students' strengths and their learning needs so that they can differentiate instruction and meet their needs. Um, our teacher team started prepping for this as early as last March. They met to analyze the taught curriculum, so what they were able to teach uh, and say they taught with confidence last year. And then in teacher teams, they made plans to integrate any missing content or skills into this year's learning experience. Um, so we are very uh, prepared to embrace all of our students and meet their needs. Thank you, Dr. Hester. Uh, I would like to make note that our Director of Special Education, Dr. Angela Taylor has joined us, as well as um, our Assistant Principal for the North Building, uh, Dr. Quitman Dillard. So again, as we get closer to the end of the presentation, and we're doing pretty good on time right now, we're trying to keep this under an hour. Um, I think we can, can meet that and also have time for, for questions. So certainly, uh, thank you, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Dillard, um, who can help answer some of the questions possibly um, as they come up at the end of the uh, presentation. So the first week of school, um, almost the same. Really, there's just one day's difference, but this was important for us in the sense that, um, you know, we have our Institute Day, which is normal for us starting on Monday, August 9. Then we move to our professional learning day um, for staff, which is a little different because we wanted to make sure um, we provided opportunities for our staff to transition as well back into the full school learning day. And this gives us some time to make sure that uh, they're taken care of and they're prepared with the uh, transition of the students back into the building. And then on Wednesday, August 11th, that's our normal teacher work day where the teachers literally have the day to themselves to prepare their classrooms, um, you know, get lessons ready, uh, equipment if necessary, and those types of things. And then we'll have our first set of students come in on Thursday. Now, this is what's different. Our freshman and sophomore students literally have not been in the building. So this gives them a chance to be in the building on their, their own, which gives us probably about, oh gosh, maybe just under a thousand students in the building. And we'd also like to invite our students who are at HF for the first time as freshmen, sophomores, juniors, or seniors, and give them a little bit more time to get acclimated uh, to see the campus. Uh, if you've been on our campus, it can be kind of daunting. It's a, it's a very large campus at almost 100 acres. So getting to where you need to go and finding the classrooms and putting your um, roadmap together in terms of which classes are situated in which hours and what the best pathway is to get there, uh, we figured that this would be extremely helpful. Also, the teachers at this juncture would only have in some cases for the upperclassmen, just a small portion of students in class, which would give those teachers more one-on-one -on -one time with the uh, new students. So that's our hope for, for Thursday, August 12. And then moving into classes for everyone on Friday, August 13. And I believe at that juncture, it's a 50 minute class period again. So students will go to all of their classes, uh, be that first period all the way through the end of the day uh, with seventh period. So we'll get this posted. So again, you can take a look at it. We do have some other things scheduled um, for Thursday. Uh, maybe Ms. Smith can talk about that at some juncture, but the orientation activities are being planned and we hope to get that to uh, our new students so that they can see exactly the type of schedule that we have for them uh, on that day. So again, a little bit more hopefully laid back and, and not a lot of pressure. Again, trying to do our very best transitioning students back uh, into the school setting for the first time in, in, in some time. So next slide. Um, as I said, the freshmen and sophomores, we're gonna take special time to, to speak with them and give them some time to really um, work with their, their teachers. We also, as I said, have a, um, a special orientation activities set up 
for them throughout the school day in hopes that, you know, this can be an easier transition for them and, and really enjoy the start of the school year for the first time for, for many of our students. And then again, on August 13th, with all students being back in attendance grades 9 through 12, uh, this is going to be important for us. In addition, we do have a number of eighth graders coming to us uh, for the first time, and uh, they too will be in the building. And uh, we look forward to, again, at that point, having all almost 3,000 students uh, in the building on Friday. Uh, Mr. Fanton. All right. Uh, my name is Craig Fanton. I'm the associate principal here at HF. Um, to talk here a little bit about our new bell schedule. This was sent out to you last week. So if you did not get a chance to review this, you might want to take a look at it, share this with your student as well, uh, because this is a new schedule. And for quite a few of us, this is going to be a big change. Um, and we know our students are going to adapt pretty well. And, and really, we, we had to uh, change the schedule to meet the needs of our advisory period, which we're going to call Viking Compass, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. Um, but just want to highlight, uh, if you notice, um, uh, our, our Mondays and Fridays, um, you know, what time we start there, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday is a 730 start. That means we have first period each day. Wednesday is now going to be our late start period or our late start day. There will be no first period that day. Um, which means every student in the school will be arriving uh, in one spot at the same time. So my advice to parents uh, and students who drive to school, please try to uh, um, account for that. And you may want to arrive a little bit earlier than you normally would. Um, it is an 844 start, but you're going to have to allow some time because we're going to have 2,800 to 2,900 students trying to get on campus at one time. So we know the traffic is going to be a little hectic, especially on that day. So just please be patient and plan accordingly with that. Um, something that you'll also notice if we have any students that are on here, they will be happy to know that our lunch period has been expanded. Um, we have a couple of things. We're gonna start uh, our lunches uh, a little bit earlier, uh, but that allows us not to have an overlap on Mondays and Fridays. So if you've ever been in our cafeteria on a Monday or Friday when we have that overlap, uh, we have about 700 to 900 students, depending on the size of the lunch, in the cafeteria at one time. And it gets a little hectic and it's hard for students to get their lunch and sit down and eat. So um, with this advisory period that we're, we're having now, this allowed us to change our schedule a little bit to, and this also better meets our needs. Uh, we are going to have <clears throat> lunch periods during fourth period, two lunch periods, and two lunch periods during fifth period. And the lunches are a little bit longer. They are going to be 41 minutes. Before they were 30 minutes. Um, and I just think that's a little bit better for our students, gives them a little bit more time to get their food, sit down and, uh, relax a little bit. So I think the students will certainly appreciate that. I know our teachers will as well. So we're not battling kids, getting back to class, trying to eat, uh, run down the hallway, things like that. So, um, notice that and please share this with your students so that they're aware of it. Um, they will get a copy of this when they're come through next week to get their textbooks and their Chromebooks, but just, uh, be aware and you want to share this with them. And go on to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we're going to have an advisory period. We, we decided to call it Viking Compass. Um, Mrs. Rudan, this is really her project. She's our MTSS coordinator. She has put in a lot of time and a lot of hours outside of the school day, along with a, a strong teacher group. Uh, so I can't thank them enough for what they did to create this. And this has been in the, work, in the works for several years now. Um, and, and to finally see this come into play, uh, we're really excited for what we have to offer our students. So every uh, student here is going to be given an advisory period. And we call it Viking Compass. It's going to be part of their normal day uh, on Mondays and Fridays. Obviously, if the schedule adjusts because of a holiday or a day off, uh, we'll move that accordingly. We will share that schedule. This is a non-credit class, but it does provide a small classroom environment where students uh, really get a chance to know each other. Uh, they get a chance to develop relationships with teachers. And we're really going to focus on the SEL, the social emotional learning of our students. Um, and, and this also gives us an opportunity to really build a community within the school. And that's something that we've really talked about over the last several years uh, is how do we do this? And, and Mrs. Rudan took this over with her teacher group and ran with it. And they've done a great job of developing uh, a curriculum that our teachers are going to implement. And uh, our students are really going to benefit from this. Go on to the next slide, please. Um, 
You know, one thing that we've always stressed uh, from the time that, that I started here back in 2001 is really trying to build positive relationships with our students so that they have adults that they go, can go to, that they can trust, that they can reach out to whenever they're having issues. And we know that when they have those strong relationships, that improves their academic uh, uh, accomplishments as well. So when they have these opportunities to build their social emotional learning, um, we know that we're going to see some su success from that. Uh, some things that we're going to talk about, self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, management, relationship skills, um, decision-making. And those are things that we've talked about over and over again. But now that we have this time built in, we can really focus um, you know, on that while not having to necessarily worry about uh, academics. You know, you're not worried about math or science or you know, anything like that. We're really focusing on our students and their well-being. And it also gives our teachers a chance to, to talk about what they do um, you know, to, to be successful and what they have done throughout their career to uh, get where they are. And, and I think that's really going to give us an opportunity to build more relationships with our students. I believe Jim's going to jump in here and talk about this. Yeah, Mr. Schmidt, could you uh, say a few things about the student supports uh, at HF? Sorry about that. I was on mute. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mansfield. Thanks, Mr. Fanton. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Jim Schmidt. I'm the guidance department chair. And I just want to um, kind of reinforce what our guidance office has done in the past. We're going to continue to do that. Uh, but we're going to enhance that a little bit this year um, as much as we can and in the areas where we can. Uh, first of all, um, piggybacking off the Viking Compass period, uh, one of the things PPS um, members will be doing we will not be assigned directly to a class in which we will monitor. We will be assigned to a group of classes serving as kind of an extra mentor, an extra support, an extra monitor. And we'll have several classes assigned um, in that fashion. And that's gonna allow us to work more closely with our students um, and, and, and get them into additional more individualized targeted supports uh, if needed. We recognize, and we've been talking about this, uh, definitely over the last year and a half, um, but certainly over the last quarter, last school year, that transitioning our students back into campus, back on the campus, back in the classroom, uh, we recognize what that's going to take and we are ready to uh, kind of have all hands on deck for that. So the other area that we want to grow in is our social workers normally would run several type of social emotional um, uh, supportive groups throughout the school year. We are going to continue to run those, um, but we're gonna enhance the number of groups that we're running and the types of groups that we're running uh, in order to meet the needs of your students. Where do we do that? We do not wanna pull your children out of class, especially as they're transitioning back into the academic aspect of being a high school student. We're um, looking at the possibility of maybe it's before school, it can definitely be during lunch periods and you know, and uh, Mr. Fanton alluded to kind of our, our enhanced lunch periods already, as well as the possibility we're looking into possibly hosting some things um, um, at the completion of the school day for students now tied into other extracurricular activities. So there will be other times in the day for your child um, to be connected into our office for those supports. And finally, I wanna come back and just stress and you know, that individual contact, that relationship with their counselor uh, is extremely important. Uh, if you're not sure where to begin in asking for help for what your child may need, reach into your counselor first. That individual contact is foundational. And from there, the school counselor is going to be able to uh, connect you or your student with additional supports if necessary. So once again, um, just start with your school, start with your child's school counselor, and then we will build additional supports from there. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier uh, about our, our, our lunch time, uh, students will be eating lunch um, at the beginning. Um, you know, it's obviously fluid, things could change, but at this time we still are operating with some social distancing. So our students will be eating lunch in the cafeteria as well as both gymnasiums. So the North gym, if your lunch is over there and the South gym, if it's in the South gym, 
Um, we will have prepackaged lunches available for purchase for students. We do encourage students to use their ID uh, and not, not, a, not use cash um, because obviously that does speed things up. And also, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, being more um, hygienic, I guess, I don't know, I guess what's the word I'm looking for here. We want to make sure we try to avoid cash as much as possible, uh, but those lunches will be prepackaged. They will have a, quite a few choices. Uh, we spent some time with our uh, food services to make sure that we still offer our students a wide variety of options. Uh, but those, uh, you know, once again, they'll be prepackaged, ready to go. And you obviously can bring your lunch if you choose to do so. Um, about our PE classes, uh, we are going to encourage our PE teachers to get outside as much as possible, weather permitting. Uh, we know our students like that, the teachers like that, a lot more space to operate. And obviously in, in our current situation, the mask can be removed outdoors. So that's a little bit uh, nice for our students to get a break from wearing the mask. Um, please be aware that students do need a PE uniform. So if you did not purchase a PE uniform, please do so. They will be available next week during our uh, textbook and uh, technology pickup days. Um, so make sure you uh, get that uniform ready because students will be changing into a uniform. And also wanna mention here our swim classes, when they are in swimming, obviously they're going to be taking their mask off when they get out there ready to swim um, so that parents are aware of that. I think at this point for athletics and activities, uh, Mr. Like, could you help us through this as the AD, sir? And also uh, Ms. Smith, when you have an opportunity for activities after this. Good evening. My name is Matt Reich. I'm the director uh, of athletics. Thank you uh, for joining us this evening. I am very proud of our athletic programs and we are excited to build upon all the success uh, from last year. The summer camps have gone very well preparing our student athletes for the upcoming school year. We are currently requiring our indoor sports to wear masks. The outdoor sports are not required to wear a mask. Spectators attending indoor events will be required to wear a mask. And as we went through everything last year, we are prepared to um, adjust with the changes of guidance from the IHSA and the IDPH um, for athletics. Good evening, my name is Gail Smith. I'm director of activities. Um, the sponsors and, and I are very excited to have activities back on campus in person. We spent uh, a year virtually trying to do as much as we could for kids to keep them engaged. So we are preparing for our uh, regular schedules with of course modifications um, as needed given the mitigations at the current time. Um, re with regards to music and theater, um, bell covers are still required inside and outside for our instruments. Masks are required indoors but are optional outdoors. And of course social distancing will be practiced whenever possible. The other activities that we have will also be um, following the same guidelines as Mr. Like had said for athletics. If we are outside, we'll be able to remove our masks. If we are indoors conducting our programming, we will be in masks. Um, we are excited about the opportunity to have the kids engaged in a lot of the activities that we've missed out on in the last year and a half. All right, some uh, important dates coming up next week. Um, most people have already completed their uh, residency and registration. If you have not done so, I ask that you please do so. You have three different ways you can do it. You can do it through PowerSchool, you can send the documents through an email, or you can come in person. Uh, so next week, starting on Tuesday, um, Students by the last name A through H, you guys can read, everybody can read through that. We are going to be distributing our IDs. We're going to be doing our textbooks. We're going to be handing out Chromebooks. 
Uh, so please, if you can make it within that uh, assigned time, that's great. If you cannot make it during that assigned time, please just join us anytime that's up there and we will accommodate you. Uh, if you have not done the residency, once again, you need to do that before you can pick up your schedule. So uh, take advantage of those opportunities over the ne uh, next week. It's also available on Saturday, eight to noon and the following Monday, one to six. Um, another important note at the bottom there, um, and I know uh, some people maybe had some trouble getting in physicals and, and health documents last year, but things have opened up and the state has said we do have to enforce this. So please make sure that we get our physicals turned in. If you're a new student to the district or an incoming freshman, you have to have that physical on file. And then our seniors have to have that meningitis shot before they're gonna be allowed to start school. We are a first day exclusionary school. So if those items are not turned in, uh, we will not allow the student to attend school on that first day of school. Um, Mr. Fanton, before you go, we had some discussion about, I heard you say picking up IDs, uh, the fact that students may have an opportunity for virtual IDs or IDs that can be downloaded as apps this year? Uh, yes. Um, I know our computer services is working out a, a way that students can present an ID on their phone. They'll have that app available. And it's my understanding that it's ready to go. It's just another way for students to be able to present their ID. Our expectation is that the students have their ID on them. Um, they will uh, be given a lanyard if they would choose and they want to wear a lanyard and have that ID out there invisible. That's fine. We have a lot of students that, that we think benefit from that um, because they don't lose it. It's ready. It's available. But we will allow them to utilize the um, uh, ID on their phone if they need to. A lot of times where we find that is at lunch or different events where they're going to need to scan their ID to get into different activities. Thank you. We have two additional webinars scheduled on August 3rd and August 4th. The fall sports season begins August 9th. Student athletes must be registered on 8 to 18 and have a current physical on file in the athletic office in order to participate on opening day. We look forward to another successful year of athletics. So well, Mr. Like, could you please explain 8 to 18 for some of our parents who may not know what 8 to 18 is? Yes, our registration is hf.8to18.com. It can also be accessed uh, through our website. So our main platform with our athletic and activity website is um, a platform through 8 to 18. You can get a bunch of information on our website. There are a number of resources. We post um, different updates and also the athletic schedules are on the main website. And then the 8 to 18 dashboard uh, is our registration platform. And that's, you can access that via our regular website, um, but you can also access it by just visiting hf8 to18.com and uh, register for any of our athletics and activities. Thank you. At this point in time, we've got about maybe 15 minutes left um, before our hour's up. So we did get a number of questions back from the survey. So we're gonna to try to field as many as we can within this 15 minute time frame. And I think at the point where we do close down, we will have a, a, a Q and A fact sheet that we can post, if not by Friday, certainly um, by Monday. Uh, we'll also, if you didn't get a chance to get into the webinar at the very start, we're going to post this. And I think Mrs. Bryan, can you help me out? It will be available online at some point. Yes, we're going to post the webinar uh, tomorrow morning as soon as we, we do the closed captioning. And then after that, we will post the Q&A uh, probably more like on Monday. And I might ask if you could take us through the Q&A here, Mrs. Bryant, that would be helpful as well. And uh, we as a collective group can hopefully answer the questions. Sure. So the first question, as I just skipped my page here, the first question is, will staff be vaccinated? Well, the majority of our staff have been vaccinated and 
in terms of requiring all of our staff uh, to wear masks at this juncture, whether they've been vaccinated or not indoors, um, that is the best outcome for us at this juncture, given the many different variables and combinations. And again, um, if staff are not vaccinated, they too will, will have their mask um, on, as well as those staff members that, that are vaccinated. The second question is, what is the plan for filling the principal position? Um, earlier this month, I did speak with the Board of Education and the plan is to hire an interim principal um, given the late exit for, for Dr. Anderson. And again, she did a great job for us and we wish her well at Bloom High School. Um, we will be looking for a full-time principal. Uh, the board felt that at this juncture to do that, um, we would need to go to a national search, which, which would include any of our local candidates as well as uh, statewide candidates and national candidates. And the best time to do that is usually October to November to start to interview for that person to be prepared to come to the school the following year. So we are indeed looking for an interim principal at this juncture. Um, we do have several candidates, internal and external, that we've been interviewing and hopefully we can make a decision within the next week or so uh, for someone to, to fill in as interim principal until the uh, principal can be selected uh, for the next school year, 22-23 already. The next question, uh, what if I have a specific question related to my student's IEP or special needs? Well, I guess I can let Dr. Taylor speak and also Dr. Wakely, if you can help out with this question. Well, I think we'll, we'll still maintain our, our protocols for students who, um, who have IEPs. Uh, they certainly uh, will have connections if they are a returning students with their case managers. Um, and certainly uh, Dr. Taylor and her staff will certainly facilitate that as well. Um, if they're new to the district um, and they're transferring in, with an IEP or have questions related to an IEP, certainly our special education department. And, and I know Dr. Taylor, who is also on this, uh, can provide the most specific uh, detailed answers to any questions that, that parents may have regarding uh, their needs of their IEP students. Dr. Yes. Taylor. Thank you, Dr. Wakeley. And so I was just gonna add um, for more specific questions, just to respect the confidentiality and the needs of the student. Um, the families can call our office at 708-335-5691. And then we will definitely review the IEP and uh, take, take your questions at that time to provide a more thorough answer based on the needs of the student. Next question asks, will my child have remote learning as an option? I think I'll turn this one over to Dr. Wakeley again, because I think this was part of the Illinois State Board of Education guidance um, at this juncture. Yeah, they're, they're uh, as I stated at the beginning, and, and I know some people have come in later, but uh, part of the mandates from the State Board of Education is that all students will, are, and all school districts are required to provide uh, in-person learning uh, to the fullest extent. Uh, so there is not the, the uh, option of um, having a remote learning uh, platform um, out of, just out of choice. So those are things that, you know, if a student um, becomes ill and has to, to miss uh, several days, they will certainly go through a process and working with their teachers to get, to get their homework. Uh, the guidance of wearing masks and staying within that three feet will, we hope, uh, significantly reduce or almost eliminate the 10 to 14 day uh, quarantine of students who are healthy who just might have been in close contact. Uh, so those type of situations we certainly think will be reduced. Uh, additionally, those uh, situations that we had last year were the the cold and flu season, so to speak, and, and even allergy seasons where kids were 
in some ways quarantined because they had some of those symptoms unless they have a fever and, and uh, they won't necessarily be out for 10 to 14 days uh, missing significant amounts of instructional time like last year. Uh, so it is our hope that these remote learning options uh, will not be necessary. We do recognize that there are situations where uh, a child may have a very specific um, health concern uh, that certainly can be addressed by contacting the school, and we can talk about what the options are to that. Uh, it would be requiring working with um, the physician and finding out, uh, you know, what's the best way to program for that student academically. Um, but uh, the, the short answer to, to the question is, is all students are required to, to be in school for full in-person learning. Okay, and then for the few eighth graders that we have, how will eighth grade parents receive information about the upcoming school year? Well, I guess we will be sending uh, correspondence to all of our eighth graders um, that will be uh, attending classes to HF. Um, in addition, we will be contacting the school districts to try to make sure that, that information gets pushed down to uh, the students, but also to the parents as well. Dr. Mansell, can I jump in there real quick? Sure. I know that my administrative assistant, Linda McConaughey, uh, has been doing uh, mailings. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Linda. Uh, her number is 708-335-5612. Uh, she's facilitated a lot of communication back to the junior highs, um, just as Dr. Mansfield alluded to. You should be hearing from them. Uh, but definitely out of our office, we've done um, at least one, maybe two mailings over the last couple of weeks uh, with schedules, uh, start times, days off, uh, things like that um, regarding picking up books, uh, IDs. If you have any questions, please reach out to Linda and she'll be glad to assist you. And next, are you planning on having students submit a document showing COVID vaccination? Well, I guess at this time, the state is not requiring that. Um, you know, I think at some juncture, it would be nice to know. Some of the school districts, uh, our neighboring school districts, are making it part of their registration process. And we're a little bit far down the road in registration to, to do that to fidelity. Um, so I think at some juncture, we will try to put together a process that's obviously voluntary at this juncture. It's not required just to make sure that we have on record to know who those students are. And, and that helps out when it comes down to quarantining and and making things happen a lot more efficiently and quicker in terms of knowing who those kids are, that should be okay. Well, vaccinations be available at HF. And that is a question that I did attempt to answer earlier. And we are looking into that opportunity and it would be our hope that there will be another event at HF in which students and family members would be able to be vaccinated. And we have so a partner. Can you go back just for a second, Ms. Bryant? Yep. Um, we, we have partnered with some of the neighboring school districts. Um, the Madsen School District, uh, Southland Prep, have invited us to participate in any vaccines. So we will get that information out to parents as well. So for those that were able to take part of the vaccination uh, opportunities here at HF, as Ms. Bryant said, we will try to stage those again. But there are a number of school districts that are our neighboring school districts that have invited us and offered. So we'll get that information out and feel free to take advantage of those opportunities if you would. And the next question is, can students use an iPad instead of the Chromebook provided by the school? And I'll go ahead and answer this in part. Uh, students are free to use their iPad when they're at home. Uh, they will not be able to connect their iPad to the school networks. School districts are required to provide certain protections and filters on our student equipment and be able to monitor uh, what is happening on our network in regards to students during the school day. So although I'm, I'm certain that the iPad Pros are possibly a little bit nicer than our Chromebooks, while they're in school and connected to our network, they do have to use their Chromebook. Uh, Steve, did you have any additional uh, content for that? Uh, no, actually, you, you hit it right on the head. It's, it's, uh, for not only the protections of the student for content 
filtering that we're legally obligated to provide, and that's what we do on Chromebooks. And also, from a support standpoint, our teachers are familiar with the devices, and our instruction is usually built on using a book uh, device. And for our tech department, uh, that's what we're trained to support as well. So the next question, a uh, parent or guardian is asking and stating that their student and members in their household yeah, are- Brian, I might, I might interrupt. We don't sure. see that. So will the questions coming now be questions that have been posed during the, the webinar in addition that didn't get posted? Well, we, we have them on the screen. Um, maybe they could advance the slide. I've been transferring them from the chat to the Q&A okay. slides. Yeah, Ms. Ganaster, is it is technical difficulty or are, we're just seeing a blank screen? Well, go ahead and read the question, Ms. No, no, excuse me. I'm sorry, Dr. Mansfield. I was on mute. No, there is um, there is nothing appearing as I, this is the last screen here that I'm able to see. Um, oh, there it popped up. Right. Um, There's, and then the next screen. If you go to slide 26, Ms. Skinaster. I'm on slide 26 now, and here's 27. The presentation would have to be refreshed because they were added after it was in presentation view. So Ms. Bryan, could you just read those? Because we don't have visual access to them at this point. Certainly. So the next question is, if my students and members in our household are immunocompromised and we're unable to get vaccinated, how do I safely send my students to, to full in-person school? Well, I, I think, uh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So I, I think at this point, um, you know, you know, in talking with, with your, your, certainly your, your personal physician on, on what's the best uh, decision for your family, um, certainly we uh, recognize the challenges that many families face uh, with, with family members who they're living with as well as students themselves. Um, we, we do think that have, taking the, um, the various uh, mitigation uh, factors that, that we've put into place are those layers of mitigation. We think that this is a safe environment. Um, we think that the um, Illinois Department of Public Health has, has also uh, would concur that these are some opportunities uh, that, that is safe for, for students. Uh, as long as students are wearing masks and are, are putting those mitigations uh, to their best use. Um, I, I say that recognizing that it is important for, for you to have conversations with your physician um, to get the, the best solution um, you know, for the health and safety of, of your family from, from your family physician. Dr. Wakeley, you talked about this one a little bit earlier. The question is, what is in place for student absences academically? A kid has allergies causing a cough, school requires right. COVID tests, et cetera, they miss school. Yeah, I think uh, that's, that's the difference between this year and last year. Uh, I think just because um, a student may have a symptom, uh, I think we're looking at a combination of symptoms along with the fever and the possible uh, close contact, uh, particularly if they are not vaccinated. So, you know, it is important if they, they start to demonstrate uh, some of these um, uh, characteristics or symptoms uh, of COVID and they're not vaccinated. Uh, and it's not, they're not typically students who have allergies or experience these, you know, kind of seasonal issues. Um, then we certainly would want you to seek uh, uh, counsel with your physician. Uh, but communicating with our nurses in the building, uh, if you have any questions or concerns, but students should be able to uh, come to school, even if they may have an a symptom, particularly if it's something like a seasonal allergy uh, or something that is, is somewhat um, routine uh, on an annual basis. The next question is regarding masks. What if they choose not to wear a mask or can I choose not to wear a mask? At this point, um, that's not an option at HF. Uh, all students and staff uh, will be wearing masks. Uh, and we do hope 
that uh, this won't be a, a long term. We we know that there are variants uh, that are that are causing some problems throughout our country, and we at HF want to make sure that that we're creating the the greatest to the greatest extent possible uh, that safe environment. So at this point, um, not wearing a mask is not an option, and uh, just like it was not uh, in summer school or last year. We have an option to take our child to school by car or by school bus. If my child does take the school bus, are there safety precautions as far as social distancing and or the number of students on one bus? Um, Mr. Fanton, you want to take a shot at this one and then I've got a few um, pieces that I could probably add in. Well, we are working on our bus schedule right now with our bus company. Um, just, you know, be, be candid that there are a shortage of bus drivers um, overall in, in the state and, and actually nationally. So we're working out the bus schedule, but we are having extra precautions. Students do have to wear a mask uh, to be on the bus. Um, we are going to try to limit the number of students that are allowed on a bus. Uh, if we notice for some reason that a bus looks a little crowded, we will try to add another route to that um, stop. Um, and, and really it's, it's gonna be a fluid fluid um, decision-making process as we, as we navigate this, because we are working with our bus company um, on a daily basis, trying to determine how many routes we're gonna be able to um, put in place. Yeah, and I wouldn't add that certainly parents, if you wanna bring your student to school, you're, you're welcome to do that. Um, and I do know sometimes as parents, you may have to drop your student off earlier just because of your work schedule. So, you know, we try to say, don't drop your kids off before 6.30 or, or, or 7. But if indeed that happens, we will try to create a location for those students to wait until the regular school day starts. And usually that's either the cafeteria or the library um, as we well, yeah. allow. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, our doors are open about 645. So if you do have to drop a student off early, uh, certainly they are allowed to do that. We will have them wait in the cafeteria. Uh, if it gets full there, we would move into the gym. But generally, you know, we have enough space in the cafeteria to spread out. And that's both north and south, Mr. Fenton? That is correct. So the next question, if students do come in contact with a COVID positive person and we're without proper masking, and need to quarantine 10 to 14 days, I would seven to 10. Uh, but is there a remote option that can occur to prevent loss of instruction time? Well, I would again say at this juncture, we're hoping everyone is masked and that's the exact reason why we want everybody masked. So you don't run into this situation because it is a difficult situation to contend with. So if indeed, that happens, uh, do contact us and we would have to set up um, some type of opportunity to, to work through that. Um, but this is, like I said, why we were at a juncture earlier in the week even to encourage mask wearing. These are some of the pitfalls that happen that just have pushed us to at this point to make the recommendation that all students do be masked because at that juncture, um, the quarantine isn't as long. And Ms. Bryant, maybe you can help me with that in terms of students sure. coming into contact with other students having been masked? Yeah, so hopefully during the school day, this won't be an issue because everybody will be wearing masks, but where it may come into um, effect would be for an outside, an outside sport. So outside sports, um, students are not being required to wear their masks because they will be outside and that's concurrently with the guidance. Uh, if students are vaccinated and come into close contact, they will not need to quarantine. So that would be an extra layer of protection and will greatly diminish the pool of students who may have to quarantine uh, due to a close contact. And we are uh, setting up um, some additional academic supports for students who will be out for various reasons, even um, homebound that has nothing to do with COVID. We are adding some, some supports during the school day that students can access remotely. So as we finalize those plans, you know, we will let you know. Um, however, I don't want to mislead anybody. We are not um, offering concurrent instruction uh, that window into the classroom this year. Uh, we need all of our students to be back in class, and it is very difficult for teachers to manage two audiences um, at the same time in class. And I just, you know, to add something to this, to put some parents at ease who maybe did not send their students to school last semester, 
Uh, for the three and a half months that we were in session, you know, we had anywhere from six to 800 students on a daily basis. Um, we did not have a single issue with the student wearing a mask. And I, I believe the same thing uh, hold true for the summer. Uh, our students were very compliant. They understand the risks that are involved with that. And I really think they just want to be back in school in person with their friends and their teachers. So I think they really, uh, you know, will follow the rules. So the next question is, will we need to upload our students' COVID vaccination card anywhere? And the answer to that is not at this time. Uh, there, there may be a time and most likely will be a time where we request that information as we move uh, more forward into the school year and look at some uh, alternative mitigations. And again, that would be a request. You are not required. Um, to provide us that information, but if required and you do provide it, it is confidential and would become part of your child's confidential record. And the next question, so when my student came in as a transfer last year, he was a sophomore and he was home the entire year. So as he returns as a junior, would he come in for the transfer student day? So, uh, uh, go ahead, sorry. So I, I was gonna say, absolutely. Uh, it's an opportunity for, uh, for students to, so he really hasn't been in the building and we want our students to feel as comfortable as possible. We know that uh, having such a lapse in, in being in our building um, makes a difference. And we want to make this transition another reason for wearing masks, you know, is, you know, we want people to feel as comfortable as possible. We know that they haven't been in this building with uh, almost 3,000 students in, in, in years or ever, and in some students' case. So we want to make sure that the, the, the transition into full in-person learning um, kind of takes away the, the apprehension of, of being quarantined or some of those other things. So we certainly encourage students uh, who are transfers or feel as though they would benefit from that day to attend. You know, and actually it's an excellent question and, and I'll go one further. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, based on this question, I would ask you and uh, Mr. Fanton to reach out through PowerSchool to find out who all those kids are and to send a personal invitation to those parents. Um, because again, excellent question in the sense that they may get lost in the number just because of their um, classification. But go back into PowerSchool, you know, pre-COVID, up until that point, find out who all those transfer students were. And if they're currently sophomores, juniors, or seniors, um, I'd like to have them get that invitation uh, to be here that first day. I know uh, Gail Smith is working on it. We've talked about it several times and, um, and I'm sure she's on top of it. Well, Gail's online. Gail, is that true? It is true. We plan to invite, of course, this year's incoming freshmen who have not been here yet. Um, last year's freshmen are current sophomores this year. And we will start with the transfers from last year. Um, we, we invited them to come on, on campus for the campus tours. However, we will invite them to come on campus and, of course, any transfers that have come in at that time. So basically, any transfers since the beginning of the 20. 21 school year we will include and invite them to that day okay well is that long enough is there anything prior to that that we need to be aware of when we first start going into the um hybrid scenario almost a year and a half ago if there is a student who was in the academic year let's see it'd be 18 19 and they were not here um that march april or may um, that would be the only kids that we would also have to include. Okay, so please include them. Okay. Can the school day begin at 8 a.m.? As an e-learning environment really helped the students. Well, I, I think at this point, uh, I mean, that is a, that is a great question. Uh, and I know that has uh, been heavily researched throughout the country. Uh, school start times, particularly for um, uh, teens or, or late adolescent. Uh, so at this juncture, uh, it's, it's probably not a possibility as the schedules and, and everything has already been put into place and we're starting school with in a very short period of time. Um, but I will say that is something that can be looked at 
Uh, I know there's some different think tanks and different innovations. There's different things. I know that Dr. Hester has, has been putting in place in order for us to be able to look, look at how do we maximize the amount of learning uh, that goes on uh, during the school day. So those are all things that uh, you know, can be looked at to, to see what's in the best interest of, of leveraging learning for our students at HF. Next question, maybe Jim Schmidt, you can answer this. How do I find out who my student's counselor is? Maybe also include social worker. Sure, uh, school counselors. Um, your school counselor is determined by the letter of your last name. That information is located on the HF website um, or feel free to reach in to Linda McConaughey uh, or myself, drop me an email at jjschmidt at hf233.org and I'll be glad to um, I'll get you connected to your school counselor. But on the HF website is the alpha breakdown, the name of your school counselor and their contact information. Uh, same with the social workers. Uh, social workers, we have four gen ed social workers that are also assigned initially by Alpha Slice. Uh, same thing, I, I, I'm gonna encourage you, if, if you don't already have a relationship with that social worker, feel free to initiate that contact with your school counselor, and then your school counselor will pull in the rest of the team members, uh, depending on what your child's needs are. Uh, someone asked if there were maps available on campus, and there are some maps on the website, uh, but if you'd like them emailed specifically to you, just please email jbryant at hf233.org, and um, I will get those to you. Next question is, will students have use of lockers for PE and general use? Yes, um, PE lockers will be handled uh, when they get to their PE class and lockers will be, you get your locker assignment when you come in next week to get your textbooks and your Chromebook, your ID, you will get a copy of your schedule. And along with that, we'll have your locker number and your combination. All right, for sophomores, how were students selected to take the intro to strategic college reading class? Sure, I can take that one. So students were selected, uh, the sophomores were selected on data that we had from their, from their freshman year. I would encourage if any parent has a question about their student's uh, schedule or specifically about that reading course, you can call our department chair for a reading, um, who is Lauren Freeman. And her information is on the website, but we'll also post it with these Q&A questions. All right, and then how does taking away hot lunch and replacing it with prepackaged lunch help our students or the school process? I was actually in the process of answering that one uh, okay. online. So I'll go ahead and take it if you don't mind. So sure. we have met uh, several times over the last couple of weeks, figuring out the best way to still offer students an opportunity to get uh, a lunch uh, hot lunch here, and they will be in a prepackaged uh, setting, but it will be a hot lunch. So, you know, we will have pizza, we will have fries, we'll have chicken sandwiches, chicken fingers. There will be, um, you know, days where they're serving tacos. There'll be days when they serve pasta dishes. We will have a sandwich line. The sandwiches will just be pre-wrapped, but as far as the pre-wrap, um, we're still kind of working out those details exactly what the packaging looks like because we want to make sure that the packaging that they're ordering is available and the supply is there. But, you know, for example, it'll be a, a plastic dish that is, you know, compartmentalized and it'll probably have a plastic film over it, but it will be cooked just before the lunches. Uh, it'll stay hot just before the lunches get there. And then it'll be placed on the, uh, uh, the stands for the students to grab. Yeah, and I might add, do understand, this isn't our normal process. You know, we still have some constraints in terms of trying to keep kids appropriately distant and what that means. And we're actually gonna have kids in the cafeteria and the gymnasium just to make sure that we can spread them out appropriately. So the amount of time that it would take to, you know, have trays go from one place to the other um, would not be efficient. So we're trying to make the best of not still so great a situation and we will do the best that we can, but do know your students can also bring a, a bag lunch. So if your students do not like what the hot lunch menu is, uh, they are welcome to bring a bag lunch, and we do have some students that do that. Um, so again, we're just trying to work with the best circumstances that we currently have. Someone asked a question about when will the bus schedules be sent for the students um, who have special transportation? Uh, 
Um, Dr. Taylor, yeah. is that a question for you? Yes, um, so uh, we're actually in the process of working on bus schedules. And so once that's finalized, um, our transportation coordinator will be sending that information out. Um, but if, if for some reason you don't receive it um, and you still have questions, you can call our office at 708-335-5691. Um, and you can call anyway, just if you wanna make sure that we're um, on your radar to make sure that you get that information. And then are students allowed to carry their backpacks throughout the day? Yes, uh, due to the fact that we have to go between buildings, we've always allowed our students to carry backpacks. And someone asked about the school lunch program in terms of adding lunch to their students' accounts. So I think it's important that uh, we go over that we do have a new program this year. Mr. Fant, do you have information on that? Um, if you don't, I actually have it in front of me. We didn't take it over because I'd be uh, doing my best. I, I have heard it, but I'm not a, an expert in it. <laughs> Oh, sure. So we used to use Rev track, or I'm sorry, school bucks for lunch. And that is where you would go to add money to your student's lunch account. We're this year with our new lunchroom provider, as well as last year, we we're using Rev track for lunches. So there is a, a difference in the process. The first step is to go online and request your student's verification code by emailing Mr. Matthews. And this is available on our website and also in the parent um, newsletter that we sent a couple weeks ago. And then once you get that, verification code, you will be able to set up your RevTrack account. If you have any problems or issues with that, feel free to give us a call and we will help walk you through that. But I think it is important to note that it's, you do have to do that in advance of the first day of school. If you try to put money on your account the first day of school, there's no guarantee that that process will, will spin as fast as you need it to. All right, next question. Um, I came into school for a week uh, during the last school year. Uh, do I need to come on the 12th? So this is probably a, a transfer student who was here for a week last year, uh, came a little bit. Are they required to come on the 12th or is it an option? You know, I would go back to uh, Mrs. Ms. Smith to make sure that they're included and someone else was going to say something. Sorry, I jumped out there, but. No, no I, was, I was just going to say absolutely. Um, you know, if, if kids feel as though it's in their best interest. Um, I, I think the, the key word is required. Uh, no, <laughs> it's not required, um, but it, certainly if they want to avail themselves to that opportunity, um, we certainly would be happy to take them. I would also add that it, it is going to be different than the week that you attended last year. Um, we are running a full schedule, periods one through seven. You will be, um, you know, learning the the buildings. You'll be learning your teachers. You'll be learning, um, you know, where your lunch will be. Um, new information about the advisory period. So there is more um, more to it than what you probably experienced in that one week that you came in last year. Is there any way to switch my child's lunch period? I'll jump in on that one, uh, Jody. Um, unfortunately, uh, no. Um, you, the lunch period is actually attached uh, to the class of that particular period. And, and as Doctor, as, uh, uh, as Mr. Fanton pointed out earlier in the year, uh, I'm sorry, earlier in the presentation, that we've changed our lunch periods and one of the reasons we've done that is to connect uh, advisory into that. So in order to do that, we had to connect advisory into a class in a particular period and then lunch into a particular class in the other period. So uh, in order to change lunches, uh, that would only happen through changing classes, um, either fourth or fifth period. Will there be a tour prior to August 12th? And I believe I heard Gail say that during new student orientation, there will be a tour. The follow-up question is, how will we know where to drop off on the first day of school? And so the answer to that is in the North Building in front of the Field House, we can drop students off. And then also in the South Building in front of door 12, but we will make sure in our parent communications, that we note where student drop-off is for the first day of school. 
Um, is door one available with the buses coming in? We do have parents coming in cars just prior to the buses coming in as the buses are here. We do prior have two buses. Mm -hmm. We do have students get dropped off at door one um, because our buses don't all arrive at once. Um, just be aware that, you know, obviously there's that bus traffic. So um, just be careful. Instructions will be in included um, with the letter that goes out with the details for the orientation on the 12th. Right. Hey, hey, Jody, I'm sorry. Can I jump back and go back into that lunch period question as I was thinking through? There may, it may appear as a conflict on your uh, child's schedule at this time, meaning your child may have a South building class mm -hmm. and a lunch and a, and a North building lunch. That is going to be corrected, just so you know. We've gone through and put in initial lunch periods. We are going to go back and check that um, uh, once we complete booking uh, and Chromebook pickup, um, and then we will check that. So if you're seeing a, a building conflict, um, we will be correcting those over the next two weeks before the start of school. What I would recommend to all students, um, make sure they check their ID. I'm sorry. Make sure they check their schedule. Um, at least the night before school begins. Uh, so then that way they'll know exactly where their classes and their lunch periods are. And do students have to take showers after PE class? Um, I used to teach PE in health at HF. I worked here for 22 years. I can honestly say that I have never heard the showers run in the, in the locker rooms. Uh, and that predominantly is thanks to a student that sued for his right to privacy in the late 80s. Uh, so they can do have the option to take showers. They do have supplies and towels and time and resources, uh, but no students are, are not required to take showers. But, but do hear clearly, all the showers are functional and they do work. Yes, <laughs> they are functional. Absolutely. Uh, will students be able to sit with friends or are the lunch areas pre-assigned? So in regards to lunch areas, the the groups of students that will eat in particular areas will be pre-assigned in terms of, you know, possibly if you're in a B classroom, your group's going to be assigned to have lunch in the in the gym and maybe instead of the cafeteria. Um, but we are not signing individual students to individual spaces. So if you do have friends within the groups that are assigned to those areas, you would be able to to, to sit with them and visit appropriately distance, of course. And then are students allowed to use phones during the school day, such as switching classes? Yes. We don't monitor the phone use during the school day. As long as except the phones during, are... Mm -hmm. Except during class, you know, and that's one thing that uh, we will reiterate to our students when they return back to the building, when we meet with them, uh, the importance of making sure that they are not on their cell phones during the school day in the classroom. Um, and, and I know it's probably going to be a little bit of retraining because they've been at home for so long and, and they've had that right there by their side uh, and access to it. But there's a lot of reasons why we don't want our students to have access or utilize their cell phone during the uh, class period. However, if there's some reason and, and anymore, I really don't even know why, because they will have their Chromebooks with them. Uh, you know, in the past teachers did allow them to use that for research or, or to look something up. But uh, going forward, I don't even see why that would be a, a reason. Obviously, if the teacher does give permission for some some reason, certainly they would have that. But otherwise, our expectation is that those cell phones are put away and, and not visible during uh, class period. Yeah, I would add just that footnote. There may be some teachers that do use particular applications uh, for phone in terms of response to questions and things of that nature. But that would be driven by the teacher. You know, aside from that, you know, I would agree with Mr. Fanton that we do have an expectation that, you know, kids aren't distracted by utilizing their phones. There are a few questions about student supply lists. Are there student supply lists for kids at HF? No, I, I think, you know, just a little different. I know, um, you know, some, especially at the junior high level, they do kind of send out that list of supplies that are necessary. Um, you know, one thing that I can think of is that they will need a, a graphing calculator for their math classes. So that is something that they would need to get. Um, but other than that, I think it's individualized per class. So once they go to their class, um, it, it, their teacher would give them a list of anything that they would need. And there's really not going to be too much unless you have 
um, a special class, you know, an art class, music, um, you know, things like that, safety goggles, some classes. So other than that, I, I don't see any one list going out of things that you need. Then my daughter will be starting the school year on crutches. She's a freshman. Is there someone to help her around? We're trying to get a wheelchair. Right now, crutches is what she's using. Uh, where can I get assistance and information? So anytime a student's injured, um, we ask that you report that to our nurse. Uh, so you can either go to the South Building, Ms. Parker, or our North Building nurse. And uh, obviously, just bring a doctor's note. I mean, it's, it's not like you're hiding crutches, but they will get a pass to leave class a little bit early and they will get a pass to uh, have a student assist them. Whoever's in that classroom with them can take them to that next class. So, Doc, uh, uh, Mr. Fan, I think the parents are asking for a game plan to start school. So can you have that parent give you a call and have a game plan for them? Sure, sure. yeah, you, you, can, you can contact me. Um, I'll be in the office from here until winter break probably. So you can give me a call, 708-335-5593, uh, or you can contact our nurse to get that set up. The question's about, about residency documents. So I have sent my documents, but I have not heard back. What should I do? Um, I guess I can't get more specific. If you send it through PowerSchool, go back and check and see if it has been approved. And, and uh, if it has been, and the rest of the steps have not been opened up, you should see steps two through seven. Um, just email me and, and I'll take care of it. It's just as simple as somebody missed checking a button and it could have been me. Um, if you sent them through email, you should have gotten a response within a day, maybe two days, uh, notifying you if everything was approved. Um, and if that, you know, if that wasn't, uh, if that was the way you did it and you did not get a response, once again, call my office tomorrow and I'll walk you through it and look and see what, what we need to do to get it fixed. And are parents allowed to be with their kids when they go for a textbook and material pickup? And then will kids be allowed to walk to their locker and put things in it on that day? Yes and yes. Uh, if you, if you want to come with your student, that's great. Uh, give them assistance. That's fine. Uh, if you don't, that's up to you as well. Um, and they will have an opportunity to go check out their locker. They could test the combination. Um, and they, if they want to put things in their locker, they certainly can. And then have seniors received information about pictures, fees, et cetera, or where would I find that information? Uh, are we talking about senior portraits? I believe so. Yep. Pictures, fees, seniors. Mm -hmm. Uh, senior portrait information will be distributed at registration. So when you come in for your Chromebooks and your textbooks, um, we'll have a station outside the library. It'll be after you've done all the other stations. We'll have extracurriculars out there. And we will have information regarding the picture days on campus for senior portraits. And then there will also be a Jotson's table there for you to gather any materials for class rings, graduation products, announcements, but also for the seniors, we will be collecting height and weight for your graduation cap and gown. So we do do that during the registration process. I think the last question is, will students be required to fill out the daily screening survey before school? Um, and the answer to that at this point is no, they will not be required to fill out the daily screener are requesting that parents still daily screen your child if they are not vaccinated, make sure that they are, are well and not exhibiting symptoms. Uh, but we will not be requiring students or staff to fill out the daily screener survey before school. Let me just check the bottom to see if there's been a submittal in the last few seconds. Uh, yes, are students allowed to bring a snack? I would say yes. I mean, it, it, they can carry it in their bag. We, I see a lot of students that'll have a granola bar, um, you know, something in their bag because you will have, they will have 11 minutes to go from uh, class to class, which is quite a bit of time. If they want to, you know, eat something on the way to class uh, outside, you know, we'll obviously do that. Um, and we tell the students not to eat in the building. And the reason could be because they could spill, they could make a mess. But, you know, if kids walk down the hallway with a granola bar, I don't think we're stopping that student uh, from doing that. You know, Mr. Fan, it brings another question into play. Mr. Wagner is not on the call. Mr. Wagner is our director of buildings and grounds. Our water fountains are not yet going to be turned on, are they? They can bring a water bottle and the refillable uh, stations are there. They just can't get a drink out of the fountain, um, you know, by pressing the button and drinking. 
Sure. So in addition to a snack, if your student indeed needs to take water for any number of reasons or would like water, um, that bottle is important or bottled water um, is important that they can keep in their book bag. During material. Also, oh, go ahead, Gail. I would also say, please make sure that your water bottle is labeled um, so that you don't grab another student, especially at a lunch or in class if something gets, you know, moved for some reason. Sure. Uh, during the pickup, can students and parents look around the school? I would think so. Is there yeah, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Um, you know, if you want to take a walk through, you're going to, you're going to be able to see, you're going to come in just, you know, if you have, you're on here, I might as well tell you, you're going to enter door 12. Uh, you will start in the gym. That's where you will pick up your card. Uh, from there, you're going to get your ID picture taken. Um, you'll get your Chromebook in there. Um, offhand, I'm just trying to think if I'm missing anything uh, thing else in there. Um, and then you're going to move down towards the nurses. They're going to check off to see if you have submitted uh, any medical documentation that's necessary. Most of the time, our sophomores and juniors really don't need anything as long as they turn in the information uh, the prior year. It's really uh, mostly our freshmen and our seniors that are going to be checked there. And then once you uh, go from there, you're going to go down and get your schedule in front of the dean's office, um, which is in the B building hallway uh, by the long uh, superintendent's hallway. And then from there, you're going to head to our tech uh, library where the textbooks will be handed out there. So you're going to see quite a bit of the building. But if you need to walk down and see a building, it's not too far down the way there. Or E building is just going to be along uh, past the library where you exit. So certainly you have that opportunity. Um, and if somebody asks, just let them know, you know what you're doing. You're just taking your student around to see the building. I would also add, Mr. Fanton, that if they have an athletic physical, they will be able to turn that into the athletic station outside the library. Um, if it's a freshman physical or your shots for meningitis or anything that uh, is required to be in attendance at school, those documents would go to the nurse at the nurse's station. But any athletic physicals would be turned in during the um, at, at the time at the athletic department table. And then our last question, will students be given a case or a bag to carry the computers in? At this juncture, we don't have any um, bags or any of those types of protective coverings for computers. So you would be responsible um, at any of the retail stores. I'm not sure Walmart or Target, Kmart um, to find or Best Buy to find one of those coverings. And I, I believe they range, I have no idea. Steve, maybe you can help me from 19 to probably $50, depending yeah. on the type of protective covering you'd like. Yeah, we've seen them between 15 and $20. Um, it, this is something that the school did explore. Um, the, the problem is, is uh, there's a huge shortage right now. So there's a big challenge in trying to provide 3000 cases just due to, uh, you know, the shortages due to COVID um, increase in costs, but um, you know, individually uh, you should be able to find those. The, the Chromebooks do have a pretty good durable uh, construction to them, um, but we will continue to evaluate and see if there's opportunities to provide that. But at this time, um, you know, we, we don't have that as an option. Yeah, yeah, and and you before know, you, I'm sorry, before you go out and buy a cover, just please know that most backpacks have that padded area in the backpack and those Chromebooks are pretty durable. And so just putting them in that protected padded slot in your backpack will most likely be just fine. Yeah, and I might add, Steve, since the question came up, could you make, me make mention of if they do have issues or challenges with their Chromebook, where they may go so that they could have those taken care of? Sure. Um, so with now the students being one-to-one, -one, we wanted to provide a, uh, you know, fast and efficient, uh, you know, support to them uh, if they're in the North Building or the South Building. So we've uh, secured a room over at the North Building where students will be able to come for any type of technical issues. Uh, if they need to get a loaner, exchange, uh, or a quick repair, or have charging issues, we'll be there to facilitate for them to get them back in class as quickly as possible. Um, Right now, uh, we're still defining which room that's gonna be. I think it's, uh, 
going to be on the second floor at north. Uh, we'll have that information provided once we know that that room is ready. In the south building, the user center is, uh, which is connected to uh, computer services. Students will be able to go there for those same types of services for any type of technical needs they may need. Yeah, and do understand those are minor technical needs. If students do indeed have, you know, more challenges and a screen gets broken or the, the Chromebook gets um, severely broken for any particular reason, then they would be responsible for the cost of the repairs. Or I should say they will, but more than likely the parents will be paying that, that bill. And in those cases, we will take it in for the repair and they would be supplied a loaner in that process. So no student will ever be without a Chromebook. Uh, but in those cases of extreme damage, um, yes, there would be a liability uh, definitely for that. But uh, we would provide a loader uh, while that was replaced or repaired. Okay, this is really the last one, I swear. And I just got it three times. So I think we should answer it. Uh, but what if someone is unavailable to pick up their materials during those pickup times? How can, how can they pick that stuff up and get a little preview of the school? Um, well, if... If a parent wants to come, if the student's unavailable, we have had parents just come through to pick it up. Um, and if it's a, it's a matter of getting the ID, we can get that ID later to the student. Uh, as far the as- the whole family is on vacation. Yeah, if the whole family's on vacation, contact me. Uh, I've had a couple people come through early. Um, you know, we will have an opportunity after those five days. Uh, I just have not posted it, uh, but it will come out shortly. Uh, after that uh, last day, I will post that opportunity. It'll be sometime bef right before school starts. Okay, well, it is 8.45, Dr. Mansfield. I think the rest we can put in the Q&A. Okay, well, we went a little over time, so thank you for being patient with us, but I hope all the information was important and clear. Uh, if not, we certainly now have provided you names to provide you with direction to get the questions answered to a to a greater extent if you need that. Um, so I would like to thank Dr. Wakeley and Dr. Let's see, Dr. Hester, Ms. Bryant, Mr. Schmidt, and Steve Richardson, along with Craig Fanton and Gail Smith. I know Dr. Dillard is still on and Dr. Taylor, and I know Dr. Cook left. And did I forget anybody along the way? Hearing I would just add, we'd like to thank Dr. Muhammad for being here and for all the support of HFPA throughout the school year. Oh, absolutely. And, and do listen for the uh, next opportunity in early September to be a part of the HFPA. It's really been a great supportive uh, tool for, for the school and, and for our parents. And we do thank the HFPA, as you said, Mrs. Bryant, for giving us a, an opportunity to take advantage and use their time uh, to make the presentation. So lastly, Ms. Bryant, please tell us when these things are gonna be posted and we'll let everyone go. Oh, you're, you're muted, Ms. Bryant. The presentation will be online tomorrow and the questions will be uh, typed up and most likely on before noon on Monday, let's say that. Okay, outstanding. So have a great evening, everyone. And thank you for attending uh, tonight's presentation.